uh, you're conservative, correct? Yes, sir. So please explain to me why this bill, why Republicans are pushing for a voter suppression bill when last year we saw record turnout in Georgia, record turnout. So why would they want to restrict voting when you just had record turnout in Georgia? Well, let me start off by saying uh, you had me uh, mistaken. I'm not a Republican. I, I do consider myself conservative. No, 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 no. Actually, um, I didn't say Republican. I said you're conservative. Okay. I said you're conservative. Right, absolutely. That's what I said. Right. Yeah, I was saying that because you called me a Republican on Twitter. Um, however, uh, with this particular bill, I don't consider uh, voting my particular fight. Um, I do consider uh, voting a, a, a asset to us and maybe something we can use as a tactic to help. But as far as us pushing voting uh, all the way out, like voting is going to be some systemic change uh, for the black community, uh, to me, is, is not w the way to go. Um, if you look at the uh, human anatomy of the body, uh, the body has as many different parts. And I do respect uh, you guys' fight, you know, in regards to voting, but I don't consider myself uh, fighting uh, for the right to vote that much. Because do you not vote? We hadn't got anything do you from not the, vote? Uh, government. Uh, yes, sir. I vote. Absolutely. OK, so when you say you guys just fight, first of all, there are multiple fights, mm -hmm. the multiple issues we can be concerned about. Voting is Absolutely. one of those issues. Are you not concerned that Republicans in your state are trying to restrict access to the ballot for no reason other than they are uh, pushing the lie that Donald Trump also pushed? Right. Absolutely. I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, however, again, that's not my fight. I believe. No, no, no. I, I, no, I asked you a question. <laughs> ask you a question. And the question is this here. Do you believe Republicans in your state are wrong mm -hmm. to be pushing this voter suppression bill? Can you give me a, a, the list of things that's all on the bill? Because I know you said uh, the, vo the voter ID. Well, no, here's a perfect, here's a perfect example. Uh, this particular bill right here gets rid of no excuse absentee balloting. Republicans in Georgia passed mm -hmm. no excuse absentee balloting 15 years ago thinking it was going to help them. They're angry because you had people who voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and also John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock won. So they're changing the law because they're angry they lost at the ballot box. But for, for 14 years, it was fine until last year. Is that, again, do you consider that to be uh, egregious on the part of Georgia Republicans? Why would they change the law? Because they lost. How about making a better argument for the voters? I agree with you. Uh, I do. I agree with you. I, I'm not against you there. Um, I definitely think uh, that is an issue that uh, I believe you guys could fight. Um, but that, again, uh, I, voting is not my issue to fight. I believe... So, uh, so, so what's your issue to fight? Uh, my issue, I fight for young black men before they die. Um, and that's what I do in my organization. Um, I do teach them to vote, but I don't tell them that voting is going to be the end, be all, end all. No one like says the be all, the end promote. all, but it's a part of it. But you guys, but you guys promote voting like it's just going to change like the systemic outlook of the black community. That's not where it's at. We have to get out and go do for self in our own communities. So, okay, so, so define do for self. Ahead. When I say do for self, you share one of my tweets, uh, my videos, and I was actually a big fan of yours, but you share one of my tweets. Uh, when I said black people need to stop begging the government and go and do for self out in our communities, you shared the video and called me an idiot. I didn't see anything idiotic about that statement No, 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 no. So when you say do for self, like what? Mm -hmm. Explain that. Okay. Okay, for example, uh, here in Albany, Georgia, we complain about our school systems a lot. Many of our young men can't read. Uh, they have very ho horrible literacy rates. We don't have any rehab programs here uh, for juvenile uh, offenders. What I decided to do, I started a program two years ago, decided to do for self, um, and I started taking children into my home. Uh, I started taking custody of kids from juvenile court, and I started molding them and training them and teaching them the skill trades, et cetera. Now I'm 21 years old. I just purchased a school here in Albany, Georgia to come back us being in the government funded schools that are not teaching our children's children what they need to learn. Um, so that's what I mean by do for self, simply getting up and going out and do it. So I have a the stereotype that I'm young black in America and I can't do anything because somebody's holding me down. So, Absolutely not. So a question. Me, you, me and you, some you, teenagers went and, go ahead, me and some teenagers went and bought a school and we just bought a school bus simply from going out and doing work. We decided to go fix our own communities. I'm not expecting anything from no politician. I'm not expecting nothing from Donald Trump, Joe Biden, or nobody. We're going to go do it for ourselves and that's what I believe we need so, to be doing. I can vote, sure, but nothing's going to change in our community. So you went to... So you Define, do for self. Man, this entire clip was maybe about a 20 minute segment from Roland Martin's show. I encourage you all to go watch it to get the full context. Lots of commentary videos have been done on it. 
But what was interesting to me about this video is that this young man, King Randall, in his opening statement, he did everything right. He immediately took away the excuse for anyone to oversimplify his message by saying, oh, you're being anti-political. Oh, you're disparaging the power or value of voting. He made it clear that he is a voter. He made it clear that he believes that voting is one of many different types of assets. He made it clear that he believes there are many different fights that must be fought in order to achieve progress, and that he believes that political activism is one of those fights, and he acknowledges the efforts of those who do it, but he was clear that this is not the fight he's going to dedicate to his life because he believes the thing that is most likely to really move the needle for Black people would be an emphasis on doing for self. What's interesting to me about this Roland's reaction and about conversations on this topic is that this idea of personal development and self-help often gets reacted to as if it is the philosophy of the privileged, as if it is anti-poor or anti-people who struggle. And rather than celebrate messages of personal development and self-help, rather than celebrate success stories, people who have made it out, Instead, we often react as if this is a threat to the well-being of our people. And we often kind of, you know, push back instead of saying, hey, how can I apply those principles into my life? Or how can I show other people that are struggling how to improve their lives with these principles? It's more like, how dare you preach that kind of thing when there are people who struggle? And so I want to have a conversation about this with you, Dr. Thunder. I want to know in your opinion, is a message of self-reliance, anti-poor, anti-struggle? Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, hello, TK. It's uh, it's good to see you. And uh, yeah, man, I, didn't do, brother, I guess I didn't do a proper introduction. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I guess good, I should say no, hi. Yeah, yeah, no, my, it's my preference to get into the business and no, no need for more for, uh, for formalities. But this this young brother's got me excited. And this is this is the kind of energy that we need to see. Um, I mean, uh, no, self-reliance is not anti-poor. Um, it just says, look, you know, are you going to wait for somebody else to do something? Or are you going to wait to I mean, consider the process all the processes involved in, uh, you know, waiting on the government to solve your problem. All right, you got to draft the bill. You got to get folks to agree on it, from both sides of the aisle. All right, you got to get it voted on. Got to get people come out and vote. Then once they vote, then stuff gets implemented. Then you got to handle all, deal with all of the logistical stuff. You know, one of the reasons, and I've said this on our show before, one of the reasons why there's such a small difference between uh, when a Democrat is president or a Republican is president, uh, you know, maybe a 3% difference in the way that we live, you and I live, is because, uh, you know, all of these big promises that they made, Democrats make or the Republicans make, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, you know, we're going to be outside the box, we, we're about to blow this thing up, and all this stuff that they, that they talk about, um, when they after they actually get in, then they have to go and talk to the folks that actually do the work, the people that their feet are on the ground, they actually know the lay of the land. And, you know, they'll have a conversation that'll be something like, hey, well, you know, um, you know, I'm glad that we got you in here. You know, this is, uh, you know, it's great, exciting, you know, to have you in. I mean, you, you had such a great campaign. Now, here are all the reasons why you can't do most of that stuff that you was, all that stuff you was promising, all that big talk, here are all the reasons, right? So see, all this stuff gets all bogged down and then you end up with no actual change. And I'd rather be in control of my own destiny, you know, cause then I can, I can control what I do. I can control my sphere of folks that I have authority over, you know, my family in particular, you know, I can control that stuff. And, um, you know, it, you know a, a change in the world starts with the change in yourself. You know, and that's not just talk. That's that's facts. And then let's let's consider how disproportionately 
um, you know, all of these uh, societal ills affect the black community over other communities. And let's also, uh, you know, look at the fact that black men, we, we're the only group that we don't, we don't get nothing from neither party. They don't, I mean, you know, consider the Black Lives Matter riots in, in, in protesting. Uh, this this uh, latest edition of this. Um, a black man was killed. That's what started this, George Floyd. A black man was killed, right? And so at first it was like they was kind of talking a good game. And then they sped right past black black men, didn't address any of black men's male issues. No, none of the issues that black men actually care about were on the Democratic platform. <laughs> it's the same okie doke. And we, and, and we feel like we're supposed to put these cats in, but then they don't do nothing for us. And Republicans don't do nothing for us either. So uh, why am I gonna sit around and wait <laughs> for somebody else to get something happening? And no, it's not anti-poor. It actually, self-reliance actually empowers the poor. It takes you wherever you are and you can improve your own situation. Uh, now that's, that's not to say that within reason that we, we, uh, that we can ignore certain systematic issues that are in government and that we can't try to do some things that we can't exercise our vote that we can't you know it's not to say that we can't do those things but uh fact is if you if you're gonna sit around and wait for the government to do something man you're gonna die before that stuff happens it ain't it ain't gonna happen something i've always taken for granted is just how and i put this in quotes because i know a lot of people take this word in different ways is something I took for granted is just how conspiratorial my concept of self-reliance is. Meaning mm. that I do not see the world as being fundamentally for me. I see my dreams as being something that must be pursued and must be achieved with the expectation that the majority of the world does not care about TK Coleman's concept of the good life and his realization of that. This lesson was taught to me by my father very early when I was complaining to him about a lot of things in my life that I was unhappy about. Not things that he was responsible for, but just a lot of things that weren't going my way. And this wasn't the full extent of the conversation, but one of the things he said to me is, nobody cares, man. Nobody cares. Mm. He made it clear to me, I care about you and I have already proven to you that I give my life for you. Your mother cares about you and she's already proven to you that she'd give her life for you. But the majority of people in the world just don't care. If you drop dead right now, most people would move on and be focused on what they're gonna eat for lunch within an hour. They'd be stressed about some project that they have at work tomorrow. Or if you have this concept of what you want your life to be, let's say in your mind you wanna be a musician and that's your dream. Well, if you never achieve that, if you never get around to pursuing it or you pursue it and you fail and you end up being something that you don't wanna be, most people don't care. They're not gonna judge your life based on the gap that exists between where you are now and what your vision of the good life is. They're just gonna judge your life based on things like, you know, are you easy to deal with for them? Do you meet the expectations for how you fit into their story? And so early on, he gave me this view of the world that says, look, man, there are people who owe you something and surprise, they're never gonna pay you back, right? You will loan money to friends at some point in the future and you will have the right to say, brother, you owe me and surprise, you're never gonna see that money. That doesn't mean you stop acknowledging right and wrong. That doesn't mean you stop challenging injustice when you see it, but your game plan for success absolutely must include more than the assumption that other people are going to play by the rules and they're going to do right by me. And I think where the message of personal responsibility falls short, one of the reasons why I think it does get framed as being this privileged message or this anti-poor message is that some of the purveyors of this message talk about personal responsibility as if the basis for it is that everything's equal and nobody's against you. And you hear a lot of people talk like that. You hear a lot of people say things like, hey, look, man, there is no racism. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. There are no white people trying to stop you. There are no white people that wanna hold you down. 
white man's not holding you back, to borrow O'Shea's phrase. Or there are people who say, hey, look, man, there's no use in going around the world like a bunch of people are against you or like there's a conspiracy or two or three or four or five. You've got to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's all equal now. We all have equal opportunity. We all have equal access. All that stuff is in the past. And for me, it's always been the opposite. I don't believe in personal responsibility because I believe that everything's okay and nobody's out to get me. I believe in personal responsibility because I'm not naive, because I have experienced since the third grade in elementary school that there are people out there who are out to get me. My parents had to teach me about kidnappers because there are people out there who are wicked and they're out to get me. I had to learn about jealousy and envy because there are people out there who are out to get me, out to hold me back. And personal responsibility says, look, don't walk through night through life naively. You better look out for yourself. You better watch out for yourself. And you better not hope that you're going to be happy because you can go on autopilot and expect that just because someone is a smiling politician or just because someone comes in your community and says, I'm for the people, that they won't stab you in the back, that they're going to make good on those promises. Nah, man, you got to look out for yourself. I mean, to me, Maybe that doesn't get talked about enough. Maybe the conspiratorial theory of self-reliance doesn't get talked about enough, but that's how I personally come at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they know you a, pre a preacher kid, right? Preacher's kid, right? Because that, that was, a, that, that would preach, <laughs> you know, that, that, that would preach right there. Um, anyhow, uh, <laughs> man, exactly what you said. I mean, the, the, the reason that, I believe in self-reliance is uh, is because of, of the existence of these of these uh, negative forces in in in, uh, in our world. Look, God is for me, but <laughs> but the world ain't for me. You know, I, I frequently have said in my life that, uh, and and I've I've seen the evidence that the world is against me and, and uh, that stuff isn't going to go the way that I want it to go all the time. I've seen that. That's been my entire life has been that. And I pressed against that. Um, and now what, what's the, what, what is the, you know, what, what is the other way? What, what is the, if, if self-reliance is not the right thing, what, what am I supposed to do? Just depend on somebody else, wait for somebody else to do something for me. And, and then that's going to be in, in some way, the way that I solve my, my day-to-day -day issues, you know, nobody cares about my issues enough to <laughs> to to custom make stuff except God, right? And and the fact is that uh, this world is a test. You know, this world is a test. This 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 existence is a test for things to come. I mean, that's the that's the Christian worldview, right? So um, so part part of what I I reject about. Um, this sort of trying to create some sort of utopia through policy, you know, that, that, that's, that's counter, that's, that's counter to the whole point of this, of this thing anyway. Now, should we just leave stuff the way that it is? And should we not even try to improve it? Of course we should, we, we should try to improve it. Uh, but I think it's the, it's wrongheaded. It's not the right approach to try to wait for someone else to do something for you. Um, you know, to, to, you know, to, to, to fix situations. And I, and to another point that you made, uh, you know, one of the reasons why people object to this whole self-reliance thing being that there's a segment of the population, Republican party is full of them that basically believe that everything is, is more or less level. All right. And so, uh, so some of the things that I would, some of my personal experiences, um, those things don't really exist. Those things are sort of a figment of your imagination. Or if those things are happening, it's far outweighed by, you know, maybe certain uh, things, certain systems in affirmative action or something, you know, different, different things like this. But of course, the issue with affirmative action and with a lot of the things that have been put in place by politicians to supposedly help black people to help the black community, right? That's why that stuff was put in place, by the way. Affirmative action was specifically laser focused on the black community. That's what it was supposed to help. But notice that all the numbers show 
that the folks that are getting helped by affirmative action are white women. All right. So you sit around and you wait for the government to do something for you. And it's going to and not only is it not going to help you, it's going to end up helping helping somebody else and putting you further behind you. And, um, you know, and I'm not trying to sound like I'm uh, this sort of untrusting kind of thing, but but I don't trust politicians. I don't trust that. But, you know, one thing that I can trust is I can trust my own work, work ethic. I can I can trust, you know, what I put my hands on, you know, the 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 you know, the sweat equity that I'm, you know, putting in the stuff that I that I'm interested in, uh, the kind of folks that are around me that I try to support and I try to prop up. You know, the people like like yourself that I, you know, I'm collaborating with trying to create positive content as it as a uh, um, as a um, alternative to a lot of the crap that we see out there, you know, that's, that's stuff that I can do, you know? Uh, and so that's going to be the stuff that I focus on. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to worry about, you know, what the government's going to do, or, you know, if, if we get these votes up, you know, you know, how, how, how much different my life is going to be in five years. Cause, uh, Cause imagine this, I mean, you put something, you get something in place right now. How long do you think it's actually going to take until that stuff actually manifests and you actually see some kind of difference? So you're, you're clamoring and putting pressure on folks for uh, talking about self-reliance because they want to see something change right now. And it might be incremental, it might be slow, but at least you can see it moving. Now, I'm supposed to sit around and wait for five years after I voted. Get out of here with that. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm an optimist because I'm a pessimist. The, the reason I'm such a self-determined person isn't because I believe that I'm capable of anything and I'm some great demigod. The reason I'm a self-determined person is because I have zero trust, man, that anybody out there is going to bed at night thinking about my success. I have zero trust that one of the top 2,000 things on anybody's mind when they wake up in the morning is trying to figure out how to help me achieve my dreams. Like, if I don't represent myself, if I don't fight for myself, nobody else is going to do it. And this thing about trust, I'm going to say a couple of things about this because you made some very good observations about trust. First, in, in Black history, there is this very rich tradition of self-reliance grounded in mistrust rather than naive optimism. I remember Bob ah. Seale was talking about how he heard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. give a talk and he was addressing at that time the wonder bread company would not hire black people and they were trying very hard mm. to get black people jobs at the wonder bread company and they would not do it and martin luther king was basically like let's give up on them they don't care about us they're not trying to give us jobs but since they're not giving us jobs let's vote with our dollars and stop giving them our money let's not buy bread from them anymore there's more than one bread company let's go support other people who hire us and who treat us like they actually value us as customers. And Bobby Seale, who went on to, to co-found the Black Panthers with Huey, Huey P. Newton, said that that moment really inspired him. And he looked up to, to Malcolm and, and Martin for those reasons, right? And you have even people like Marcus Garvey and so on who had this sense of, man, we got to do for self because they don't really care about us like that. They're not really going to do anything for us. And, and we've all had moments like that in our personal lives where we give up on people, but it's a very empowering kind of giving up. It's not, it's not the sort of giving up of apathy that says, well, they're not going to help me out. So I guess success is impossible for me. It's more like the kind of giving up that says, yeah, man, like stop, stop begging that girl to go out with you, man. She don't like you. Right. Stop begging those people over there to be friends with you. They don't like you and they have demonstrated it in their behavior over and over again. And as long as you keep waiting around for them, thinking they're going to change, as long as you are an optimist about them caring for you and showing you that they love you, that's just going to hold you back from doing the stuff that you need to do to make yourself available to other options. You keep begging that girl who clearly doesn't like you to like you, then you're missing out on the person that does respect you. The person that does appreciate you. The, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'll come back with another thing about trust, but go ahead. Yeah, you know, you know, man. Look, the 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 whole see, it used to be that uh, uh the black community and black people in general had sort of a, a standoffish sort of approach to 
dealing with uh, the white community and white folks as far as like, is this, does this person mean me well or not? Um, but that thing has gone all the way from that to um, I need white folks to validate me. You know, I'm mm. not anything unless your systems, your programs, the way that you have your stuff set up, um, unless I see, you know, uh, a certain percentage of, you know, uh, numbers in your community, you know, oh, I got to make sure that every board has got black folks on it like this. It'd be a minority. It'd be like one or two of them. It's, you know, that's the way that I, uh, that I you know, that we, that we look at stuff, it seems, it, you know, as black people in general, of course, um, that's not the way that I see it. Um, I mean, you know, some of my, some of my best, best friends in the world are, are, are white folks and they themselves, I don't have any, any issue with, but I also know my own worth. I know who I am. I know what kind of value that I have, you know, and I know whose I am. Right. And so, um, I don't need your validation. I don't need you to, I don't need you to co-sign me. I don't need you to, to give me anything. All I want you to do is stand out of the way. That's all. Just stand out of the way. If you can do that, then, then I'm, then I'm cool. So the, the self-reliance thing for black folks really has a lot to do with, um, part of it is about stop looking at white folks as the way to to co-sign or validate you you don't need that <laughs> you, you don't need that you can look in yourself and find that value and uh and then uh from the fruit of your own labor you can uh you know create a real value in society and that's i think that's what we need to focus on more rather than this whole, um, you know, waiting for someone to, to create a policy that, that, you know, specifically mm. is going to help our community and like this. Mm. And I, I, I'm sorry to say, I see no evidence. I see zero evidence that's, that that's ever going to happen. Zero. Yeah, man. Self-reliance is really a word that describes the initiation of change rather than the totality of change. It's a word that talks about the starting point for getting things done rather than a word that describes all of the details and specifics of how you get things done. So when we talk about self-reliance, we don't mean that you arbitrarily refuse and resist the help of others. We mean that you refuse to wait around for that help to come before you choose to do little things that can get you started. We mean you resist the idea that you don't already have the permission and the power to do something about the situation that you're in, even if you can't do everything about the situation that you're in. It's a way of rejecting the idea that you have to be limitless in order to be powerful, that you have to be able to do everything or anything in order to be able to do something. Self-reliance is a philosophy that says you can always do something, even if you can't do as much as would be ideal and you never have to wait on anyone to get that process started. And if the help comes, that's awesome, but know that that is a luxurious response to you getting started. And when it does come, it often comes as a result of what you attract to yourself by being the right. one to initiate that sequence of events. And so it's not anti-poor, it is pro-poor. I, I, I'll use an, um, uh, an anecdote. Let's say you have a rich uncle and unbeknownst to you, he left you a $5 million inheritance. But you also have an enemy who has enough control of information, enough influence to keep you from being aware of this. And so you're living your whole life and you're struggling financially, you're poor, you don't even know about it. And let's say someone finds out about the inheritance that you have. And they come to you and they say, Dr. Thunder, you're struggling financially. Brother, you don't need to be struggling like that. You're supposed to be rich. Now, I don't know what we're gonna do about it, but I know there's some money in your name and we gotta figure out, we need to talk to some lawyers, we need to talk to some movers and shakers and figure out some things, but brother, you're not supposed to be living like this, man. You could be living more better. Now, there are two reactions we can have to that. 
One reaction could be, so, so what, man? Are you saying that I'm stupid for struggling? Are you saying that I've been wasting my whole life? Are you saying that I'm, that I'm nobody, that I'm dumb for, for, for not knowing about that? Or we can say, what do we do? And I don't want to put all the pressure on the person who's reacting to the message. I want to put pressure too on the person who's giving the message, because I suppose you wouldn't give that kind of message unless you genuinely cared about someone really being able to actualize the possibilities that, 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 that are meant to be in their life. And so you want to help people understand that there is a distinction between empathizing with current reality and striving for a better future reality. And we can say, hey, look, you're not stupid for being in the position that you're in. There's nothing wrong with you for not knowing what we're talking about. Sometimes we don't know things because the people around us never taught it to us or they didn't know it themselves. But the question is, once this knowledge becomes available, what do we do with it? What do we do with it? Yeah. And how can we celebrate this knowledge and the value of it without making people feel stupid for all the years they spent not having it. And by the way, this is something that we do to ourselves too. You, you learn a valuable lesson about standing up for yourself or improving your finances or you know um, articulating your needs. And then you say, man, if I had only known this 10 years ago, why was I so stupid for not getting it 10 years ago? And then you spend more time bemoaning the fact that you didn't get this revelation in the mm -hmm. past than you spend enjoying the benefits of having the revelation now. So it's something that we have a hard time doing with ourselves, let alone each other. But the message is a liberating message, as long as we preach it yeah. with an understanding that promoting ideals is not the same thing as opposing an, an empathetic attitude towards where we happen to be right now. Yes, totally agree. One more thing about trust, man, because because you mentioned trust, and I think trust is one of those funny words because it's kind of like nice. Be nice. You should be nice to everybody. We we treat trust as if it's this thing that we should dole out, and 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 we leave no room for middle ground between trusting people and being complete antagonistic, cynical jerks towards them. And there's actually a middle ground. And this middle ground is, is the one that reminds us of the importance of always demanding evidence for our beliefs. You shouldn't treat people as if they're out to get you if you have no evidence that they're out to get you. And you shouldn't treat people as if they're gonna change your life for the better if you have no evidence that they're gonna change your life for the better. If you have no evidence either way, you should say, I don't know. I don't know. Let's inquire into the matter. Let's see where the evidence leads. And trust is one of those things that I don't believe we should give out to people just because they occupy some lofty position or they have a certain title. And you see a lot of this kind of talk right now, you know, hey, I'm a politician. I have a very important job. You should trust me. Hey, I'm an actor. I'm the star of your favorite movie. You should trust me. Hey, I have a PhD from this university. I'm a celebrity. You know, you should trust me. <laughs> and it's like, well, trust, first of all, depends on what it is you're claiming, right? What are you actually claiming to be true? If you're making an assertion about reality, I wanna know what that is. And if that assertion is true, then the truth of that assertion is something that should be substantiated independently of any appeals to your personality, your individual greatness, because it's true. If it's true, it's not true because of you. Even if I know it because of you, it's true because it actually corresponds to reality. And I think we need to step back a little bit from this, this view of trust that says we should just give it to people out of goodwill. We have to make people earn our trust. When people come into our homes, they come into our communities, they come into our individual lives, and they tell us, you know, like, hey, this is what I'm going to do for you to make your life better as long as you just put your faith in me. I'm open to the idea that they're going to do something for you, but you got to demand evidence for that. We can't just make trust the default position, make skepticism, healthy skepticism, the default position. And, and, and don't, yeah. don't make it about the person, make it about the proposition. It's not about who are you, man? Who are you? Where did you come from? What's your background, man? Who's, who's your father? 
uh, what country were you born in? Like, like, no, show me the results. Because some people check all the right boxes when we do the personality analysis and they don't generate results. And some people may not check all the right boxes when we do the personality analysis, but what are the propositions they are asserting to be true and what are the results they're producing? That's where our trust should be. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a logical fallacy called plead, plead to authority. So if uh, someone is in a certain position uh, or plead to popularity, you know, it's, it's, it's different but somewhat related in this context you know we, we tend to we tend to believe you know uh, if someone is a, a star if someone is well known even if they're saying things that are not in their wheelhouse so you know you could have I don't know Morgan Freeman you know uh, saying some statement about you know, some principle in physics or something it's like well th this dude is not a physicist why why am i why why does why is he even weighing in on this issue uh, but you see this pretty often where folks that have no expertise are because they're celebrities they're weighing in on stuff that they have no knowledge about and uh, and uh the uh the producers, the, the marketers, they're marketing uh, to us this with the expectation that we're not even going to question, you know, uh, let alone stuff like, you know, the dude in a white lab coat, some actor in a white lab coat, you know, talking about how something is safe, you know, or something. It's like, well, wait a minute, you're not even a doctor. You were hired to say this. And, you know, because you're in a lab coat, you're trying to take advantage of my sort of conditioning of seeing certain uh, certain attire and associating, uh, uh, you know, scholarship or, or uh, you know, some, you know, some, uh, you know, extra credence or something, you know, like, <laughs> so, and, 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 and fact says is even if it was a doctor, even if it was a physicist, that said, you know, said something about whatever their particular discipline was, we still want to evaluate what it is that they're saying. And we want that to yes. stand alone. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. I think so even when we're dealing with experts, because we can say, hold up, why would we listen to this guy? He's not even a doctor. But two things about that. First, many of the brightest minds in different fields of study were themselves people who never met the criterion for being an expert in that field. So if you go to any philosophy program at any university, you're going to study Socrates, right? But Socrates didn't have a PhD in philosophy, but I'll take a conversation with Socrates over 90% of the people out there with PhDs, right? And so many of the people that university students study in school as the greats to be emulated, many of those people themselves did not actualize that greatness or unearth that greatness within the context of school. And many of them were not people that were PhD holders and so on, you know? Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that's an important reminder, not that we should go around disrespecting people's expertise. I don't think we should go around being like, you have a PhD? You the same as me. I think there's room to acknowledge the effort and work that it takes to drill down and research a particular topic and master your craft. And, and I, I believe we need to preserve that in all of our quest to balance the discussion on expertise. And it is also true that whatever is discovered or, or pontificated upon by an expert should at least in principle be independently verifiable for those that are willing to do the work. So if you are an expert and you're making a point and you're talking to someone that has questions or they have doubts, the last response in your toolbox should be for you to turn red, get mad and take it personally that they're questioning you and say, hey, you should just listen to me because I have the PhD in this topic. I mean, if you have the PhD in this topic, then it should be super easy for you to be like, hey, look, man, 
I'm just trying to save you time, but like, don't take my word for it. If you have all those questions and you got the time, because I'm, I'm just accustomed to dealing with people that want to hear the expert talk about it, but I'm happy to make a list of 20 books you can read. I'm happy to give you a five-year journey to repeat all of my research. If that's how you like to get down, I, I love to provide the roadmap. I'm not going to take it personally at all that you want to follow my rabbit trail and investigate it for you. And I think, I think we need more experts talking like that because sometimes you do have experts and authority figures who, when they're questioned by people that don't have their credentials, they kind of like, who are you talking to? Do you know who I am? And I think it's a perfect time for experts to educate and actually show what they're really good at, which is the ability to provide a roadmap for people that want to do their own research. That would make experts a lot more trustworthy to me. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I, my, my, <laughs> my doctorate is in music and we ain't talking about music. So obviously I, I have some, uh, 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 you know, I, I, I believe that I'm, uh, I have a voice, you know, uh, in certain areas and certain topics that I uh, are not due to academic study. Um, uh, but I think that the, uh, yeah. So, so, so obviously, uh, you can speak on topics and you can develop opinions uh, that are valid opinions, but that's still, it's still up to the person listening, taking in the information to do their own homework, to say, okay, is this guy pulling my leg or not? You know, that, that never yeah. leaves the, the discussion. It doesn't matter if the person is an expert or not, you still have the responsibility to do that, to do that work. Yeah, when you outsource your judgment to another, you are implicitly placing trust in your judgment to do that very thing. So you're, you're never free of responsibility for the choice you make to trust another person. So if I say, you know what, Thunder, you're the expert on all the music stuff. So you tell me what the right answer is, and I'm just going to go with that. It's still TK Coleman who's making that decision. Of all the people that I could choose to trust, I'm choosing you. And I could choose to be more skeptical, but I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to prioritize and say, I'm comfortable with the risk of being wrong. I know that I could spend an extra two days thinking about it, but I'd rather spend that time doing other things. So by the time I get to the point of saying, I'm gonna trust you to make this decision for me, that's totally something you have a right to do, but you still gotta take responsibility for that because it takes trust in your own judgment in order to place faith in another person's judgment. Yeah, well, and plus, Amen. you know, I'm, pre I'm pretty good. So, you know, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I want to play this second video. This is a clip from the same uh, episode with Roland and King Randall, because Roland kind of questions him on some stuff with government and expresses the problem that he has with Randall's message. Because when you're watching this, at least to me, I'm just like, come on, Roland, like, if a young man says do for yourself and your first response is to kind of like defensively be like, define do for yourself, define, if that's what you're worried about, that just seems a little weird to me. But let's watch this second clip from Roland and then I wanna go into a second question, which is based on Roland's viewpoint, how much focus should be on government and politics? Second clip coming up. The people, who's, the people who I hear the most who yell do for self, you know what? They get a whole lot from government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you say so when we say do for self, we can't divorce ourselves from the reality of the role that government plays. Well, this because is in the fact, same in fact, America. Your school, your school, you bought. You have mm -hmm. to, that has to be up to code, correct? Uh, yes, absolutely. That, that's government. Okay. And so we can't, so this notion of removing ourselves from government just doesn't exist because we deal with it every single day. Uh, so I definitely don't uh, hold my tongue regardless of whatever party they consider themselves in because I'm independent. And so when you talk about um, bu building uh, uh, what you're doing there, um, mm -hmm. what, what's the next step uh, for that? 
Oh, absolutely. All right. So right now we just purchased our school. Um, and again, we were working with boys 11 to 17, um, and we were working with grades 6 through 12. We have to renovate our school right now. Um, and after we get finished renovating our school, um, we're also going to start um, our summer program where we're going to teach 40 young men how to build two houses uh, from the ground up. Uh, we're going to get Lowe's to sponsor this for us, and we're going to make that happen. Um, so right now, uh, we're just trying to get every, all our ducks in a row, uh, get the accreditation that we need um, so that way the children can use their uh, diplomas to go to college, et cetera, and also do dual enrollment uh, with Albany Technical College uh, here where we are to, you know, work in the skilled trades. Um, our biggest thing is trying to make sure those children who may not want to go to college um, also have a way um, to, to make it and to see that they can make it. Uh, so for me being young and 21 and, and doing these things for them, I just want to make sure that they know they can be young, black in America and still go make it happen regardless of the stereotypes they give us. You spoke of accreditation. Um, mm -hmm. Who is it? From who? Uh, we have, the, I think, it's, uh, the Georgia Accreditation um, Commission. That's government. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. See, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the point I'm making here is that even with the effort that you're doing, you cannot divorce yourself from government, which means that... Less when, which, hold up, which means that <laughs> for you to be even more effective, what's important is to have individuals who are in power in government who are not standing in the way of what it is that you're trying to do. In fact, they are encouraging that. The problem is when we have individuals who are blocking the very thing that you're talking about and not providing access to folks, whether it's voting, whether it's contracts, whether it's participating in this so-called American dream, that's the fundamental problem I'm talking about. So when I say we have to, we have to fight on all those fronts, we can't say I'm going to just do for self as if I don't have to deal with this whole system, we got to make sure that there are people who are in power who are sympathetic to folk like you, but who are not trying to make what you're trying to do harder. All right, so clearly here from this clip, Roland Martin is representing the position of, hey man, I got no problem with do for yourself and you building a school. But let's be clear, a lot of the people that use that language are people that depend on government for a lot of things. And even your version of do for yourself, as you just described, involves relying on government or interacting with government in various ways. And so there's this concern that your conversation might be either underselling the work that other people are doing to, you know, in government, or it's misleading people by teaching this idea of do for yourself that can be divorced from government. What's your response, man? If you were on Roland's show, what would you say? Man, this dude is moving the goalpost. <clears throat> okay. So, <laughs> so interfacing with government because he was trying to get his school accredited or, uh, you know, making sure that his building is up to code. So then therefore having to, uh, you know, you know, get a government, uh, uh, you know, an agency involved in doing that. That <laughs> that is in no way at odds with the idea of doing for self. And notice that uh, doing for self is not does not necessarily have to be at odds with uh, uh, with other things. You know, uh, doing for your community, uh, voting. You know. Um, you know, cultivating policy. Um, you know, uh, getting. You know, uh, you know, dealing with. Uh, you know, politicians. Uh, you know, uh, contacting your congressman. You know, and your your representative, uh, and letting your grievance grievances be known. It, doing for self is not at odds with any of those things. Um, you know, it's just one of the. Frankly, I I have to I have to say this. Uh, in the black community in particular, it is one of the things that is not discussed enough. It's not talked about enough. You know, um, so I applaud what this young brother is doing and uh, not allowing the usual things that folks would say. Now, do you think that Roland Martin wouldn't have, would have been the cat that would have been encouraging this young brother to you know, buy this school, to go through all the stuff that he needs to, to go through to get the summer camp going, you know, um, 
uh, to get mm. all these other brothers involved in this. You think he would have been the one encouraging that, or would he have been the one, you know, crapping all over it? Because you know you can't do that because the government's going to get in your way. And see, the thing is, is that the power of self-reliance is such that you don't know what can happen unless you get out there and start doing the work, start getting it happening. Uh, and it is uh, something that you said earlier, you know, uh, usually it is the case that once you have something moving, then folks will come and want to partner with you after they see that, you know, some stuff is, is actually happening. Um, you know, that you're being productive now. Okay. Now that sometimes that seems like, okay, you just trying to wait until I get to the finish line, but there's wisdom in waiting for something to start to, uh, bearing fruit before you, before you come aboard, there's wisdom to that. Um, that's not all nefarious and, 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 um, you know, and, and everything, but you know, Roland, th this cat wouldn't have been the cat that would have been supporting you know, this initiative, if this brother came to Roland and said, hey, man, check it out, man, I got this thing I want to do, you know, um, hey, you know, you got some seed money or, or you think you can help me get a grant or something. This cat is not going to be the cat that helped him. Just just judging by by his. Uh, yeah, but his, his general disposition. But uh, again, he's moving the goalpost. The discussion that he continued on mm. is because he saw that he didn't have a pathway forward there. So he said, "Okay, wait a minute. Let, let, let me let me be clever here. Let, let me build a straw man, and let me let me see if I can if I can go there. I, I that that's 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 aggravating." This this interaction was kind of a, a good illustration of something that we talk about a lot, which is the difference between debating ideas versus debating implications. And debating ideas is when you address the substance of what a person says and the arguments that are set forth on behalf of that in the moment. Whereas debating implications is when you try to anticipate what it would mean for society if you acknowledge that what this person is saying is true and then you react to that instead. Now, yeah. I love to talk with Roland about it, but I think he was debating the implication rather than the idea. I think if you judge King Randall by what he said on the show, when representing right. himself in the moment, it was amazing. He checked all the boxes. In fact, he never said he was anti-government. He actually said that he voted. He actually said he believe, that he believes it's an asset. He just thinks we expect too much of it. But I, but I think Roland's first words to this young man when the, when the show first started are telling. The first thing he says is, you're a conservative, right? And I think that is what captures the reaction. I think Roland was responding to this man because he knew that he was talking to someone that shared different political beliefs than him. And he couldn't help but listen to this man's message of do for yourself. He, he couldn't help but hear it through the lens of what he thought the conservative implications of that are. Reason being is because I, I give Roland more credit than a lot of people who listen to him because I actually listen to Roland. I've listened to lots of Roland. And I do know that he has supported people who preach do for yourself. Roland has had people on his show. He's talked to people that are doing things that aren't even about waiting on some politician to come deliver us. Like, it's like, yo, let's support black businesses. Let's support black media. Roland has vouched for a lot of people. And he, he should get more credit from the people that's criticizing him right now for at least that much. But I think what was different about this guy is this guy's a conservative and rather than just celebrate him i feel like roland kind of was in this place where he might have felt like if he celebrated what the guy said on the show that would be tantamount to endorsing everything that any conservative says and i think that i think that stifles a lot of discussion man everything gets so politicized that we have lost our ability to concede other people's points and to celebrate other people's achievements when it's coming from a different political philosophy or party because everything is about scoring points for or against our team so if a person that's a liberal has a conservative say something that's brilliant and smart it's like well at best i got to be quiet about that if a person that's conservative here's somebody that's a liberal say something that's brilliant and smart it's like well i got to be quiet about that because i don't want anybody to think i'm endorsing 
the totality of their belief system by celebrating them in this moment. And I think it would have been a better look for Roland to just be like, bro, I disagree with you politically. I think you're wrong about a number of things, but regarding this thing that you're attempting to do to bring education in our communities without waiting on the system to make it happen for us, I think is commendable. And I encourage you to keep going. I think that would have been a great illustration for the people on how we can have conversations across the political spectrum. Yeah, it starts off definitely disingenuous. Um, uh, and the very first thing was uh, he, he had, if, albeit somewhat slightly, had, had moved the goalpost even before he even started the conversation. Because as the young man said, that he had tweeted out that, that the young man was a Republican. But, but, but he called him a conservative on the show because he realized that he couldn't, he wouldn't be able to make that stick. So then he moved it, he moved the goalpost even preemptively before they started. Um, the yeah, other and, thing and he, is, and he called is him that, out with such confidence, right? He called him out with such confidence. He was like, "I didn't say, I said, I didn't say Republican. I called you conservative. That's what I said." And then King Randall had right. to correct him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I follow you on social media. I mean, the, I think one of the kind of funky things about this whole thing is, um, is that the young man is was he said that he was a fan. He was a follower and a fan of his, but you know, I, I doubt that he's a fan anymore after kind of being treated that way. Um, but uh, yeah, the the uh, what was I going to say? The the uh, but there's the nuance with the, like the conservative and Republican thing. Thing is, is in the black community, um, though we we tend to vote Democrat, we actually are very much conservative. So uh, when this ki when this guy sort of uh, he describes himself as being conservative or uh, independent, That's that would actually fit with most of the black community. It's just that we tend to vote, <laughs> we tend to vote uh, against that sort of core sort of conservatism. Um, and uh, yeah. You know, an another thing about this whole discussion too is I think it's important to recognize when conversations are not on equal footing. This comes up a lot when I talk about alternative education and uh, alternatives to college. Whenever I make statements like, I think it's possible to be successful without a degree, that I don't think you have to go to college in order to get a good job, in order to live a meaningful life and have an amazing network. The first thing that people want to do is they want to get me to acknowledge that it's okay to go to college if someone wants to. They're very concerned that when I promote alternative education, that I might mislead the world into thinking that it's a bad thing to go to college. And I always remind people when they put me in a corner where I have to say this, I always try to remind them, we're not having a conversation that's on equal footing. The overwhelming majority of people from the time they are in high school or even earlier are already conditioned to believe that the next logical step in education is to go to college. The, on the other hand, the number of people that choose to opt out are going against a strong amount of social momentum. And the majority of them who choose to pursue an educational alternative are going to be put in the position of having to answer some very difficult questions about their plan from family and friends. Whereas the average college student, because they're going with the tide of things that are already acceptable, their parents aren't going to respond to them by saying, well, are you sure you want to do this? Right? So, and I accept that. I understand that that's how it is, but it's important that we frame the discussion properly and not treat things as if they're being talked about by the media in the same way for the same amount of time. And I think that's what's here with business and politics. And I think this was the point that Roland missed that Randall was hitting on. When it comes to talking about personal development, talking about economic self-sufficiency, talking about starting your own businesses, we do not have too much conversation in black communities about those things. We do not have some sort of epidemic where we just got way too many brothers 
focusing on making a lot of money, getting rich, getting out of debt, getting financially free and aren't politically involved enough. Like no black folks are talking about politics, but all we wanna do is talk about economic self-sufficiency providing for ourselves. And we've solved most of it. We, we don't have that problem. In fact, it's, it's the reverse. And this is where I think Randall was right. Show me a person who was not told at least 10 times this last election, you got to get out and vote. Where is that guy? But when it comes to personal development, getting your money together, starting a business, we're actually afraid to be preachy about that stuff. We're very afraid. That's when live and let live kicks in. We don't dare go up to other people in an unsolicited manner, expressing opinions that we have about a diet that is clearly unhealthy. We don't do that. We think that's rude. We're very afraid to be preachy. But when it comes to politics, we lose that fear. And we're very confident telling people that they have a duty to society to get out there and vote. And so I think Randall is trying to have a conversation that we don't have that same sense of duty about. We don't take people to task telling them things like, hey man, you got a duty to become economically self-sufficient. Hey, brother, you have a duty to become healthy and develop your, your physique and be physically fit. Hey, brother, you have a duty to be reading at least one book a month. And if you can't read, you need to learn. How to read. Like, like, we don't say that because we think that's rude. And so these conversations are not on equal footing. Roland is fighting for making sure that we have this balanced understanding of a view that is already the dominant view. It's already yeah, a common he's... dominant view that people should vote. You know, everyone already says that. Like, mainstream media you can't watch tv during election season without being told 10 times in a single day that you ought to do that and get out there and rock the vote but it's the other message that's missing and that's underrepresented that hey we can achieve economic freedom and we should yeah but that's not that's not sexy though that's that's not the hotness you know yeah um it, it's hard to do stuff that stuff that is hard to do stuff that requires a lot of sweat and labor and intensity and struggle and um you know uh you know tweaking and and all the, the stuff that takes all of that stuff in time that's not the stuff that you know it's easy to get people to do voting heck you don't even have to know anything heck man just make stuff up when you get in there who cares if you know what the what's going on? We just want you to get in there and vote, you know, uh, because it's just it's just a single act. Bang. OK, I did it. All right. Now, now I'm off the hook for the next four years. You know, that's uh, you know, I have I have a lot of issues with. You know, that there's this. Uh, Voting is like, I, I mean, it's it, it's it's in league with sort of pop culture, several aspects of pop culture. Um, you know, the stuff that seems to become popular, wildly popular, and even stuff that's like viral, that goes viral, it tends to be uh, stuff that sort of appeals to the lowest common denominator, right? So the, the maximum number of people will be able to get something out of it. And it doesn't tend to be something that is, uh, that requires effort, you know, that requires, you know, a certain knowledge base, uh, a certain sophistication. It doesn't, it doesn't require that stuff because if it did, there's not enough folks that, that are gonna be willing to put sort of skin in the game uh, you know, for that now, but for that reason, that stuff tends to be also fleeting. It's not stable. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, you voted. Okay. It's, you know, it's, it's very fair weather, you know, uh, it's, you know, there's no, there's no substance to it. There's no skin in the game. There's no, you know, there's nothing that'll stick to your ribs. You know, it's, it's none of that. It's this really, uh, you know, fast food, you know, diet, 
<laughs> or something, you know, it's it or if it's 60 ribs, it sticks in the wrong way, you know, so it's just uh, There's a there's a there's a real problem that we have um, We have spent so much time uh, Telling people that there's always an easy way um, uh, And look for the easy way, you know, if if you um, You know, if you're struggling too much, that must mean that you're in the wrong career you know, if you, you know, if you don't like to practice, maybe you're not supposed to be a musician. You know, if you, you know, don't like to go to the gym, maybe you shouldn't be an athlete. You know, this stuff should come easy to you. We, we've been telling folks this whole, this whole thing, and it's a bunch of malarkey. And I think it manifests uh, disproportionately in a negative way uh, in the black community. Uh, we've bought all of that stuff. We bought all of it. We bought the whole thing. And, you know, the point that you were making about economics, I believe that economics is the primary issue in the black community. It's the primary issue. It is the issue that would address and fix everything else is economics. Uh, and now it's not because now understand, it's not that black folks don't spend money or have assets. Matter of fact, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the black community spends about one point seven trillion dollars, you know, it, every year. Now that would make us like the sixteenth country in the world as far as the uh, as the economy spending power. The issue is that we're not supporting any, any of our own stuff. Our money is constantly going out to other folks because we don't tend to support our own communities. We don't tend to support black owned businesses and all of this kind of stuff. And to the credit of this young brother, I mean, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to, to build up something that will be owned by us and supported and serving us. That's the kind of stuff that we need to do. And so I'm disappointed when, uh, you know, black folks of a certain age, I, I'm just gonna put it that way. I'm, I'm trying, you know, of a certain age and up, they tend to have a certain allegiance to um, the government that I think young folks don't, they don't have that same, they don't have that same, you know, allegiance and good, God bless the younger folks for not having that allegiance. Cause look, look that, that allegiance hadn't done nothing for us. <laughs> we're the same place that we yeah. were when we, when we first started trusting them. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Roland did a good job, as so many people I've had conversations with do, of like pointing out, see, can't escape government. See, government's a part of everything. See, and I, I think what often gets missed is the distinction between um, acknowledging the role of a thing and placing unrealistic expectations in what that thing can deliver. So yeah. let's say, for instance, let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to celebrate with you and be like, man, that's awesome. Congratulations, bro. I'm really happy for you. But then let's say in the midst of celebrating, you're jumping around and you're like, I can finally get that beach house in Los Angeles. I'm going to be like, uh, we might want to slow down and have a talk because I think you might be expecting a hundred thousand dollars to do more than it can actually do. A hundred thousand yeah. dollars is great. It's fantastic. It is really worth being happy about. But if you are happy because you think that $100,000 is going to get you a beach house in LA, you're setting yourself up for heartbreak because that amount of money is not capable of achieving that kind of result. And so when we talk about the things that play a role in our lives, it's not enough to just speak about something being useful or something being an asset in these abstract general terms. We have to say, what is the proper expectation I should have, a, have of a thing? based on what it has delivered in the past, based on what it even purports to deliver, based on what it is optimized to deliver. And sometimes we celebrate these political achievements like a man who thinks he's gonna buy a beach house in LA for $100,000. And it makes me wonder, are you expecting too much out of this thing that you have received? And we need to temper our expectations and not look at, political solutions as the thing that is going to define us and determine our destiny. Because as has often been said many times before me, 
that political change is just a lagging indicator of the change that begins at an individual level with the daily choices that people like you and I met. King Randall, you ever want to join us and have a conversation with us about the changes you're trying to create and the mission you're promoting? We love the dialogue with you. Roland Martin, I know you're a lot bigger than us, man, and you may not ever even see this, but if you want to join us, we, we'd love to have you on here, man. We have a totally good faith conversation, hear your side of things and so on. So um, anybody know those guys and want to connect us, let us know. Please leave a comment. Let us know if you have any questions or feedback. Please hit the like button, the subscribe button. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. If there's a topic you want to hear me and Thunder discuss, don't hesitate to let us know. Dr. Thunder, man, it's been good, brother. All right, man. You have a good one.